Good evening, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Pandemic Dialogues, Conversations in Civic Crisis. This is a virtual seminar series to provide perspective on our current public health and civic crisis through conversations among our school's faculty and students, expert guests, and a wider community. I'm Paul Caris, Director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at Arizona State University. Part of the school's mission is to promote civic dialogue about pressing issues of our time. And throughout each academic year, we host a speaker series called the Civic Discourse Project, which extends the conversations and debates of our classrooms to a broader community. Arizona PBS records those speaker events and broadcasts them. Given today's new normal, we had to postpone our final two lecture events of the year until the fall. You can visit our website to see all of our previous lectures in the Civic Discourse Project at scetl.asu.edu. We invented the idea for the pandemic dialogues in the past few weeks to try to sustain the intellectual community we've built with students, ASU colleagues, and the wider community in our regular speaker series. We're offering these dialogues in two modes this series of live webinars, each discussing a great work or a deeper perspective on pandemics and civic crisis, and a podcast discussing Camus' novel, The Plague. More information on the pandemic dialogues, both these webinars and the Camus podcast, and also information on our school, again, is at our website, skettle.asu.edu. Our first webinar topic is on Thucydides and his Great dialogue, his great account of the plague that hits Athens. We entitle this episode, Ancient Athens in Crisis, Thucydides on the Plague. Thucydides was an Athenian general who wrote a history of a three decade long war in the fifth century BC between the Athenian and Spartan alliances. He was then exiled by the Athenian democracy after failing to thwart a particularly daring Spartan general who captured an area of Athens empire. And he used that leisure in exile to write an extraordinary history of the war. It is partly a chronology of battles and political decisions. It's partly a study of the contrasting political cultures of Athens and Sparta. And it's partly a work of philosophy or political theory. It is such an extraordinary and rich work that it's been preserved and studied for 2,500 years. And in America, it's studied in colleges and universities also in military academies and war colleges. Among the more widely cited episodes in the history is Thucydides' striking account of a horrible plague that hits Athens early in the war. I'm now delighted to welcome our two panelists, Clifford Orwin of the University of Toronto and Catherine Zuckert, who is a visiting scholar here in the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at ASU. We'll have three parts to tonight's webinar, an opening presentation for Professor Orwin, then questions for Cliff Orwin from Catherine Zuckert and myself. And in part three, we'll have a Q&A session from the virtual community that's joining us. So please do type your questions using the chat feature in Zoom and direct them to our colleague, Luke Perez. He will collect the questions for the Q&A and you can also use the hashtag pandemic dialogues on Twitter to participate in the discussion as well. So our guest tonight is Clifford Orwin, Professor of Political Science, Classics and Jewish Studies at the University of Toronto. He's also a distinguished visiting scholar at the Hoover Institution of Stanford University and a founding senior fellow of the Berlin Bochum Thucydides Center in Germany. Among his many scholarly writings in political theory and in Jewish political thought, he is the author of the book, The Humanity of Thucydides. It was first published in 1994 its fourth edition came out in 2011, and a Mandarin translation was produced in 2015. He also is regularly commissioned to write articles and book chapters on Thucydides and his continuing relevance. I'm joined to pose questions to Cliff Orwin by Catherine Zuckert, an American political philosopher and the Reeves Drew Professor of Political Science at the University of Notre Dame Emeritus. Among Catherine's many works of scholarship are three books, Natural Right in the American Imagination, Political Philosophy in Novel Form, Plato's Philosophers, The Coherence of the Dialogues, and most recently, Machiavelli's Politics. 
She also has co-authored two books on the political philosophy of Leo Strauss with her husband, Michael Zuckert, who also is a, vis a visiting scholar each spring semester in our school. So now to Professor Orwin. Thank you so much for joining us. And we now look forward to your opening presentation on Thucydides, his extraordinary work on this long war, and the account of the plague within it. Um, I want to thank um, Settle for this opportunity. <clears throat> it's a great honor to participate in this very first of your new series of webinars. I spoke here in person a month ago, how long ago that now seems. And I was impressed by the quality of the questions. I, I look forward to more of the same. Please forgive any awkwardness in my mode of presentation, as this is my very first try at a digital visiting lecture. Larry Diamond, a leading scholar of democracy at Stanford, has described the novel coronavirus as, quote, not only America's worst public health crisis in a century, but also the most formidable challenge to its democracy since World War II. Diamond has never been one to mince words, and perhaps it's still not too late to hope that the event will prove him wrong. Yet who can deny that it may well prove him right? If this does indeed unfold as the decisive crisis of our time, it may do more than shake up many of our ways of doing things, whether as individuals or as a people. It may also shatter many of our usual ways of understanding them. This last transformation has yet to occur. Daniel Schillinger, a young American political scientist and recent Toronto PhD, observes in a piece forthcoming in the journal Public Seminar that so far the pandemic has played a very different role. It has been the mirror in which every pundit has seen his or her agenda reflected and therefore confirmed. What good would a pandemic be if it didn't demonstrate beyond all doubt what I've been telling you about income inequality or the defects in our medical insurance system or the inspiring decisiveness or feckless incompetence of the current administration? Take your pick. If it didn't confirm in the biggest possible way what I as a Democrat or you as a Republican have been saying all along. The coronavirus and its threats may be new, but it's human nature to cope with the new by assimilating it to our old ways of thinking. Until we can't, until the cognitive dissonance, as our psychologists would say, between the new reality and the old thinking becomes too great to bear, and all those old ways come crashing down. God save Americans from such a fate, which befell the people of Athens as a result of the famous plague that afflicted them in 430 BC. Like so many events in history, it is famous because it was lucky in its choice of chronicler, Thucydides, son of Aloris, himself an Athenian, born around 470, died around 395. While Thucydides is generally called an historian and even accounted the greatest of them, the term is something of a misnomer. For unlike our historians who concern themselves with the study of the past, Thucydides wrote of his own time and often of his own experiences. His most immediate relevance to us rests on a striking parallel between that time and our own, including his plague and our own. Quote, people always, uh, I'm going to quote the words of the great 20th century Polish intellectual Czesław Miłosz. Quote, people always live within a certain order and are unable to visualize a time when it may cease to exist. The sudden crumbling of all current notions and criteria is a rare occurrence. The 19th century did not experience the rapid and violent changes of our century, whose only possible analogy may be the times of the Peloponnesian War as we know them from Thucydides. Thus Miwash writing in 1983, the world wars and attendant revolutions had introduced an epoch of instability from which the world had not yet recovered. If anything, globalization by interconnecting everything has per perpetuated the insecurity of everything, including as our recent series of pandemics has confirmed, our health. Thucydides thus speaks to us as a prophet of radical insecurity of which the plague of his day serves him as exhibit A. The very first thing he tells us about it, after briefly tracing its rampage through other climes prior to its infesting Athens, was that it was incurable. This is not the least respect in which his plague resembled our own, at least so far. 
There were physicians in ancient Athens, of course, but they merely died in greater numbers because of their greater exposure to the illness. They were equally powerless to prevent the death of anyone else. Of course, physicians then knew little, dispersing only doubtful remedies for any illness. Still, they were respected artisans, and their impotence was the plague's first refutation of a comforting presumption. Thucydides makes no further mention of them. The second such reversal, to which Thucydides moves immediately after his dismissal of the doctors, was of the presumption of assistance from a higher quarter. Supplications in the temples proved unavailing and were soon abandoned. There was no comfort to be found in them. Like the laymen disappointed in the doctors, the pious found they had nowhere to turn. Having thus established this most important of the facts about the plague, Thucydides proceeds to a detailed description of its symptoms at each stage of its progress. This he can the better, better do, he says, having suffered from the disease himself. Thucydides clearly recognizes what we might call a duty of care to enable subsequent generations to recognize any recurrence of this plague. Despite his meticulous description, no such recurrence has been noted, nor has any consensus emerged as to that plague's identity. Thucydides' account of the course of the plague is deservedly celebrated as clinical, thorough, and repulsive. Even so, what follows it is of greater importance still, for it places his treatment of the plague in the context of his project as a whole. That is to provide the definitive account of the fate of societies subject to the utmost stress. The stress in point is that resulting from the greatest war known among the Greeks up until his time, that between the Athenians and the Peloponnesians. The plague is an episode of this war and Thucydides treats it accordingly. It's not just that it occurs during the hostilities, which it complicates and which grievously complicate it. It's also that occurring as it does early in the war and therefore in the work, it supplies him with the first of his case studies of a society under unbearable stress. Thucydides then is a political historian and the body and its ailments become relevant to his narrative only when it emits a screech of distress too loud for politics to ignore it. His primary concern is with the plague's effects on the behavior of its victims and the wider society. Indeed, for all his attention to its physical ravages, he describes as, quote, its most terrible feature, unquote, not any of, it, of those symptoms, but rather the dejection when anyone felt himself sickening. Quote, for immediately judging their situation hopeless, they were much more likely to give themselves up as lost than to resist, end of quote. Dejection here is the Greek athumia, the lack of that feistiness, thumos, essential to democratic citizenship. Used as the Athenians were to resisting suspect ambitions inside the city and Greek and barbarian invaders from outside it, their spirits quailed before this still more relentless foe. Thucydides here suggests that it was not the plague itself, but rather this dejection that sealed the fate of many of its victims. Survival was possible, if not likely, for those not too cowed to fight for it. Nor was this the only way in which the best Athenians resisted the ailment. Some who were yet unscathed by it, defied it to meet their obligations to friends and kinsmen. Quote, Taking virtue seriously, they would have been ashamed to spare themselves when it came to visiting their ailing friends." Unquote. This is the first indication we received that some Athenians, not these, were practicing social distancing, that is, cowering in their homes for fear of contracting the ailment outside it. Indeed, if those who ventured out were the noble exceptions, then those who remained immured must have been the rule. And Thucydides offers at least a backhanded concession that such dis distancing was somewhat effective, namely that those who disdained it, the better people already referred to, suffered the highest mortality rate. Indeed, we might think of them as parallel to the caregivers of today, if lacking their professional expertise, recognizing it as their duty to care for their sick friends as best they were able they did so and paid the ultimate price. 
Not all of them, however. For as Thucydides has already made clear, there were survivors of the plague, himself included. These now enjoyed immunity from it. And he shares two striking facts about them. The first is that buoyed by that immunity, they displayed the greatest compassion toward those now suffering from the disease as they had done. Can we hope for the same from the ever growing throng of caregivers who will fall into this category? The second is that some of them believed that having survived this deadliest of afflictions, no other could kill them. Presumably our caregivers and even our ordinary citizens know enough science not to fall for that one. The rest of Thucydides' presentation of plague-struck Athens is still bleaker. It concerns the progressive demoralization of the city under the plague's relentless onslaught. Here again, the key is the reversal of all the usual expectations, crucial among which is simply that each of us has a future. He writes, and it was the plague that also in other respects incited greater lawlessness in the city. For people now readily dared what before they had done covertly rather than as they pleased. No one was keen to persevere in what had been reputed honorable, holding it uncertain whether he would achieve it before his destruction. Instead, the pleasant and whatsoever was gainful to obtaining it were established as both honorable and useful." End of quote. Especially poignant here is the fate of the noble or honorable Tokalon in Greek. The episode immediately prior to the dialogue, to the plague, is that of Pericles' famous funeral oration. He asked the Athenians to strive for the utmost nobility, to live for the sake of posthumous reputation. He asked them to imagine looking back on their lives from the viewpoint of the most distant posterity and to guide themselves accordingly. This meant, above all, to subordinate their pleasures and their bodies to the good of the city to live for it and be willing to die for it. The plague discloses this vision as illusory. Most Athenians persevered in their quest for honor only for so long as they expected to reap its benefits in their lifetime. Given the prospect of reasonable longevity, they cultivated their reputations. The plague, by attacking this prospect, overturned everything. Not only did honor cease to restrain the Athenians from debauchery, it actually encouraged them in it. Quote, again, the pleasant and whatever procured it were established as both honorable and useful, unquote. Honor dies hard. Even the plague, it seems, didn't so much abolish it as invert it. Despising what they had earlier honored, people honored what they had earlier despised. Thucydides continues, fear of gods and law of man deterred no one. For as to the first, people judged it all the same whether they performed their devotions to the gods or not, seeing that all perished regardless. And as for crimes, none expected to live to come to trial or pay the penalty, holding that a much heavier sentence had been pronounced and hung over them, and that before it fell, it was only fair to enjoy life a little. Just as the plague transformed the notion of the noble or honorable without eradicating it, so those living in its shadow maintained their attachment to justice. The irony was that this very attachment to justice now supported their little crime sprees. They felt it only fair that they should devote themselves to illicit pleasures. The penalty having already been pronounced, who could begrudge them the crime? Thucydides here exposes a profound truth. Irrational as the sentiment is, we feel we have a right to our body and its life. When they are threatened, be it by mindless illness, we respond with anger as if to injustice. Why me implies not only a complaint, but an accusation. If then there is a consistent theme to Thucydides' presentation of the plague, it is the corrosive effect on society of the reversal of its reigning expectations. This is the issue that his treatment of the plague shares with his later and even grimmer one of civil strife. Both episodes recount the shattering of customary structures of meaning. Both feed moreover on a sudden and massive insecurity of the body. That for which we look to society is first of all protection for our bodies. But it proves more fragile and the body therefore more vulnerable than better times have prepared us for. 
by exposing the helplessness of society and the consequent irrelevance of its norms, the plague sends life at Athens into a tailspin. This Thucydides offers not as an indictment of Athens, but as a flaw of human societies as such. No regime is proof against the acute vulnerability of the body. Has advanced modernity solved this problem? Will we, who enjoy assets unimaginable to Athens, avoid the disorder into which plague plunged her? Will our fundamental expectations from our common life be overturned as hers were? As our plague is still in its early days and so much remains uncertain about it, the jury is out on these questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clef. Uh, you've set up a great conversation. Um, in a moment, I'll turn to Catherine, but, uh, but uh, our tech staff organizing all this asked me to make an announcement. Some people joined us a little bit late, and uh, I think I gave the wrong directions. If you're interested in posing a question for the third part uh, of our event tonight, you should use the Q&A feature in Zoom. I had said use the chat uh, feature. So if you'd like to pose a question for part three of our webinar, use the Q&A feature in Zoom, and our colleague, Dr. Luke Perez, will be collecting those and, and channeling them to us. So now I'm delighted to turn the floor over to Catherine Zucker to pose the opening question to Cliff. Professor Orwin, uh, you've reminded us of Thucydides' statement that the worst thing about the plague was the dejection or the athumea. <laughs> Uh, into which the people who contacted it fell, that they didn't uh, have the strength or the spirit to resist. Um, and you have also shown us that it wasn't just the people at the beginning or just um, the good people who tried to help them who uh, fell prey, but um, people lost their faith in any higher power and um, also the law became ineffective. So I would like to press you a little bit further on this. Um, are you suggesting that Thucydides is showing that there is actually um, no, or that he takes the crisis to show that there is neither a natural nor a divine support for morality? No. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't think the Thucydides reacted to the plague as ordinary Athenians reacted to it. And of course, th again, it's very important to remember that the plague account is just an episode of a much wider and broader account, which addresses these same questions. It seems to me that the question of a higher power remains unresolved in Thucydides. That Thucydides is skeptical, um, I think it's fair to say, but for a variety of reasons, one could not regard him as a dogmatic unbeliever, right, of the sort that we know in modern times. Right. As far as nature is concerned, um, nature, um, in, in, if, if in, the absence, in the absence of the divine, with, with a question mark over the divine, mm -hmm. nature may seem um, a force that is indifferent to human concerns. And there's a lot of evidence in Thucydides that he subscribed to some kind of pre-Socratic natural philosophy. It was very difficult to pin it down. The experts in our philosophy department in Toronto <laughs> think that Thucydides is probably closer to Empedocles than any other pre-Socratic uh, thinker in that respect. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that nature in its very purposelessness or vicissitudes doesn't support a certain human way of life. <laughs> um, and that human way of life um, um, could be described as one of a, of, of, of a certain kind of moderation and a recognition um, that ultimately um, man proposes but nature and fortune dispose. And I would say that if there's a lesson um, in the plague, um, it's above all that, that the best laid plans, or let's say the second best laid plans, which is how I would describe Pericles' plans, <laughs> not quite the best laid, but the second best play, laid plans have been um, off, 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 off go astray. Um, and that that, um, that is something I think which, which the plague demonstrates um, resoundingly. Also, of course, the law of unintended consequences, because a necessary aspect of Pericles' strategy was to move the 
population in from the countryside, conceding that to the Spartans uh, while defending the city, which was defensible against the Spartan superiority in infantry with uh, walls had been built specifically for that purpose by Thucydides' great predecessor, Themistocles. And it was this overpopulation of the city um, which rendered the plague much more grievous than it otherwise would have been. Again, I don't think that Thucydides blames Pericles for not foreseeing the plague. The plague was unforeseeable, but this is just you know, further, further evidence that the unintended consequences of one's actions can, can often far surpass in significance the, the intended ones. I, could I follow up by asking you a little bit about the follow up that because um, after the plague, uh, Pericles first leaves the Athenians who aren't fighting very well on an expedition that doesn't distract them. And then the Athenians turn and they blame Pericles. He says that he's not at fault. This was unpredictable. But I have always wondered whether Thucydides simply agreed with that because Pericles certainly didn't bring on the plague, he didn't create it, uh, but he did encourage them to go to war. And as you've just detailed, the crowding in the city, which made the plague much worse in Athens than any place else was a result of that step. Uh, one could perhaps connect this dire result with the imperialistic policy of which it was part. All right, I'll see you and I'll raise you. <laughs> I'll raise you by saying that what's more, there was a curse on Pericles' head. The curse of the Alcmeonids for a, for a terrible violation of sacred law perpetrated by one of his ancestors, on which the Spartans trade in the exchanges before the outbreak of the war, actually insisting that the Athenians exile Pericles because this curse hangs over him. They, of course, know that the Athenians won't exile Pericles, but they hope that the some of the mud of the curse will stick. And it is important to recognize, as the Athenians did um, when they were struck by the plague, that the god Apollo, after all, speaking through the Delphic Oracle, had indicated that he sided with the Spartans in the war. And Apollo was, of course, the Homeric sender of plagues. <laughs> there are certain other things. I mean, Thucydides never wants us to forget the pious man's understanding of the world never wants us to forget the extent to which the truth about the world confirms that understanding. So if you want to say that Thucydides himself sees Pericles as a dubious character, that Pericles is not Thucydides' hero, as is so often asserted, mm -hmm. that he sees him as a somewhat dubious character and his imperial policy as a dubious one, I think that actually that's, that's, that's quite right. Um, and I think that Thucydides has his own critique of Pericles. I don't think that part of that critique is that Pericles didn't foresee the plague. Although I will say this, and maybe I'll, I'll backtrack to a certain extent, as I wouldn't if this were a job interview. I'll backtrack to a certain extent and say that. Um, it is a problem with Pericles that he is excessively rationalistic. And because excessively rationalistic, excessively confident in his analyses and predictions, right? So this is not the only setback that Pericles and his plans receive. It is a very significant setback and it was unforeseeable, but you could also say that the very fact of overcrowding the city did expose the city to unforeseeable consequences of, 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 of various sorts which therefore in a way became foreseeable, right? So that even, even if the plague was not foreseeable, to swell the population of the city with so many homeless um, and impoverished people, right, would have, would have been a problem in any case. I, th I think I have to cede the floor, at least temporarily. I think you'll get one more turn at least, Catherine. <laughs> Could I follow up on this theme of Pericles' mode of analysis about human affairs and, and politics? It's, it's somewhat more focused on the question of technology and the confidence the Athenians have. So you, you mentioned he develops this extraordinary, unprecedented strategy to bring all the Athenians inside these walls, fortifications, to the main city and to the port. And the other technology that he is supremely confident about is naval technology, that, that the Athenians have command of the seas and nobody uh, uh, 
Oriental, Asian, or, or, or Western Greek can, can defeat them. Um, and Thucydides in book two and throughout uh, the other books of the work has this alternating sequence or strong juxtaposition of great pride or ambition by the Athenians and then catastrophe. And I, w I wonder if, if it, here in this part of, of book two that we're focused on, if it isn't particularly clear about Pericles, because we get, as you mentioned, the funeral oration, great pride in, in Athens, then the plague, then Pericles gives another speech in which he is not apologetic at all. We still are the greatest, we're the model for all of humankind, and our naval superiority makes it possible we could have global superiority, there's no limit. And then, and then Thucydides immediately tells you, he sort of jumps forward in time and says, and Pericles died shortly thereafter this, this final uh, speech. Thucydides doesn't tell us that he dies of a plague, but another great classical author some hundreds of years later, Plutarch, <laughs> as Pericles died of the plague. So is, is this a particularly emphatic point or am I overreading Thucydides in trying to suggest that Pericles was a bit too ambitious and overly confident, especially in the technological superiority? And of course, we're interested in what this means for our 21st century situation with mo modern science and technology and our own sense of confidence. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's a, 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 a very good question. I, and I, I wish I could offer a simple answer. I can't. Um, there seem to be two al alternating versions of the basis of Athenian superiority, one of which is virtue, you know, arete, the other of which is art, techne. Uh, techne not being the same as technology, I would say, um, much more a question of habit or practice. And um, Athenian naval superiority is presented as a result of experience um, and techne. Um, they practice. Um, and one of the wisest thing that Pericles did was to use much of the imperial tribute to finance this practice, right? That the Athenians, instead of going to work each day, could, could practice the na naval maneuvers each day, right? And this gave them a tremendous advantage over their, their opponents. Um, in this respect, they were like the Roman legions, right? They had made naval warfare their business, right? In the way the Roman legions later made land war for their business in a way that no other people had. And they did therefore have a navy of extraordinary power, confidence, coolness under, under coolness in battle. And then there's the virtue side of it, right? Which Pericles emphasizes in the funeral oration, which is all about the virtue of the Athenians. So you can say that the virtue of the Athenians, which he tends to present as inborn, um, converges with the techne or the experience um, as the basis of these um, vast Athenian ambitions. And um, it's not entirely unreasonable. Um, I mean, obviously every people exaggerates its own achievements, but after all, the achievements of the Athenians had been great, right? In defeating the Persians 50 years before, um, in building up this, 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 this vast empire, in holding their own against Sparta in the various wars that had occurred during those 50 years. The, 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 the achievements of Athens were indeed great. And of course, not only its achievements in, in, in war. And the power of the Athenian navy was indeed greater than that of any other navy of the time. And in the end, the undoing of Athens was not due to any lack of its power that Thucydides emphasizes that, and therefore not to a failing of techne or of arete, insofar as the arete is supposed to anchor the power. The failure was political. And I would say that if there's a Thucydidean critique of Pericles, it actually is for his failure to foresee the political failure, which ultimately led to their losing a war, which was eminently winnable and which in fact they should have won. Can I, can I follow up with the question, are there any analogies that come to mind? Uh, I, I didn't introduce you before as also writing occasional columns for a newspaper uh, up in Canada. So we, we, but, but I'll reveal that now. We know you're attuned to uh, current events and current circumstances. Are there any analogies about Thucydides analysis that you think might apply to the global response to this pandemic, the American response to this pandemic, other liberal democracies more generally? 
Well, um, I, I, I do owe the newspaper a column on this subject on Wednesday. And so I was naturally hoping that all of you would write the column for me right, by your responses to my talk. And so far, you've been very, very helpful. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that um, technology is for us what that combination of virtue and art were for the Athenians. That certainly is true. And I think that it does come as a surprise and a shock to us of how unprepared we are, especially in the face of what I heard an eminent physician describe as a wimp virus that can be defeated with mere soap and water, right? That somehow this virus, right, has brought our society to a standstill, this wimp virus. And so I think that it is, it, it does come to a, it does come as a kind of shock to us children of Machiavelli to be reminded of just how much nature remains unconquered <laughs> in spite of all of our efforts to conquer it. Um, and I also think that the failures have been and will continue to be, unfortunately, also in large part political failures. Right? Because I think there's, there's, there's no doubt that the, the, that the US effort and certainly also efforts in other countries have been very much hampered by um, the need of various political figures to you know, spin these events one way or the other, right? In the way most damaging to their political opponents, which generally speaking has not been in a way most helpful to the societies, especially because it stood in the way of a concerted response to the crisis rather than favoring such a response. Catherine, the floor is yours for another question. Uh, all right. I, I think this follows pretty uh, naturally, if I can use that word, um, on the discussion. And that is the question of political responsibility, which we've um, already suggested is a part of Thucydides account. And it certainly is on the minds uh, of people today. And I guess the, the question would be, what is an appropriate response on the part of a leader? Pericles says, I have no responsibility. This was unpredictable. Um, and I, Pericles, remain the same. You Athenians have changed because now you no longer see the way your individual fates or the fates of your household depend upon the good of the greater political community. Um, the Athenians being angry, they still insist on punishing him. Um, it's not been clear to me how successful that particular argument or attack on Pericles' part was. And I'm wondering, what should we expect or hope from political leaders in the face of an enormous crisis like this? Well, of course, what a, what a leader ought to do depends in very significant part on what he can do. And in the case of Pericles, there was nothing that he could do to stanch the plague, you know, absolutely nothing. Like every other Athenian, he was powerless in the face of it. It simply burned itself out. For him, again, it was an episode in the war and the crisis was a crisis of his leadership and therefore of the war. So I would say that in fact, his final speech was very effective in that it did persuade the Athenians to stay with the war despite the fact it was quite clear that a majority of them at that point had been in favor of giving it up in the face of their various reverses, you know, the plague first and foremost among them. And Thucydides accepts responsibility for his policies um, and, and but insists, right, that those policies were the correct policies and remain the correct policies. I don't, it was necessary for him to do that. Um, and and, and that was a necessary part of winning the people back I regard the final speech as Pericles' finest hour, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's an absolutely extraordinary speech and an absolutely extraordinary accomplishment, um, what he was able to do to bring the people, uh, to meet the people, a, a wonderful example of democratic leadership because he met the people where it was, completely, completely sunk in, in, its, in its misery. Um, and in a few paragraphs, <laughs> <laughs> takes them out of that misery <laughs> and restores them, right, to a much broader view of the world and of their place in it, um, and restores their resolve, right, which had been, which had been wavering. Um, and I've, I've, so you could say that he, in his way, rescued them from their atomia in the face of the plague, which the policy manifestation of which was a willingness to give over the war. I mean, they even went so far, as you recall, to send envoys to Sparta, 
which the Spartans foolishly dismissed. <laughs> the Spartans should have quit while they were not so far behind, right? And, uh, you know, I, so I'm, again, I'm, I'm not inclined to, um, to find fault with, 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 with Pericles there. Um, I, I also should, something I should have said in response to an earlier question of, of, um, of Paul's, which is that on the question of ambition, I think that actually Thucydides' critique of Pericles' war policy is that it wasn't ambitious enough. That is that there's a fundamental contradiction in Pericles' position. On the one hand, recognizes his indispensability to the Athenian people behaving sensibly. And on the other hand, encourages them to pursue a war policy which might well require them to pursue it beyond his lifetime. Because after all, he was already old by Greek standards at the time that he died. He was in his 60s, we think. We don't know exactly. <laughs> no. and, uh, you know, and so I think that you know, there, there's, there's more than a hint in Thucydides that actually Pericles should have pursued a more aggressive war policy than he did, one that might have won the war in his lifetime. Only then, actually, in a way, would the policy have been successful. Um, as it was, Demosthenes, who actually was a greater strategist than Pericles, devised a policy that brought Sparta to its knees very quickly and at very little cost to Athens. But by then, you know, the leadership of the city had passed to Cleon and you know, everything, everything went to hell in a handbasket. Uh, I actually think, and in this section that Thucydides presents um, a positive view of Pericles, um, I tremble to disagree with you about anything in Thucydides, but I wonder whether uh, Pericles doesn't say, first defeat Sparta, and then we go on. It's not clear to me that his um, ambition is limited to the war. It's just no, that no, no. You're quite right. You're quite right. The presentation of the Athenian Empire in the funeral oration is universalistic. <laughs> right, this one never sets on the Athenian Empire. <laughs> Make good on that by conquering India, you know, Singapore. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've said and that then, there are these these patterns. Right. So one is natural disaster, and the other is. Uh, and then also, as 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 Paul said earlier in the final speech, the vision of the boundless sea and of the Athenian power extending everywhere in the boundless sea does point in the direction of universal empire. So I think that you're quite right about that, that all that Pericles ever says is don't try to extend your empire while the war is on. But the difficulty there, again, is that their inclination to extend the empire is so great, even in, during the war, that it, it, as he recognizes, it's only he that is holding them in check. Mm -hmm. And I think that recognizing that, he should have drawn the final conclusion that therefore, it actually had to be a quick victory over the Spartans so that the Athenians could then expand the empire in safety, because otherwise they would try to expand it during wartime as they did with the Sicilian expedition, and that would prove to be exceedingly unsafe. Wow. Go, go ahead. Well, but I don't disagree that he has a very positive view of Pericles, you know, but you know, it's, 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 it's sort of like the Bible, right, or Shakespeare, right? None of, none of the characters is perfect, <laughs> even the ones who are presented in the most positive light. Thank you so much. We have quite a few questions in the queue. I don't think we'll get to all of them, but I'll, I'll start uh, with uh, Roy Miller uh, here in Arizona asking about the question of honor, uh, Cliff, that you pointed out earlier. Thucydides suggests that honor is inverted under the stress and crisis of this plague. So in comparison to our 21st century, 20th and 21st century situation, he asks, is our society or civilization somewhat similar so that we might see dishonorable acts arising under the stress of COVID-19? And as if that's not a hard enough question, he asks a, a second question. Um, has honor improved under all of the prosperity we've had in the past 50 years? Uh, to take the inverse of Thucydides um, insight. So what's the connection between stress crisis or prosperity and, and honor? Well, or nobility. Yeah. Thucydides himself suggests that honor is somehow old fashioned. Here I would have to look at other passages in the work that suggest that. And that honor is somehow old fashioned and that the tendency of all rationalism, including in the end even Periclean rationalism is somewhat to undermine or diminish honor and I think that one actually sees that in the case of the plague. I mean, that 
for most human beings, it's reasonable to pursue honor for so long as you hope to reap, reap, reap the benefits of that pursuit. The chief benefit, of course, being really the reputation for honor itself and everything that that reputation brings in terms of one's, one's self-esteem and the esteem in which others hold one. But that under the circumstances of the plague, it no longer um, became reasonable to pursue honor since one had no hope of living long enough you know, to reap the benefits of, of reputation that honor brought. Um, plus, one might say that those benefits no longer seemed as great, right, as, as one you know, saw the grave yawning before one. But the most interesting thing about that is the inversion of honor, right? Not that honor disappeared, but that there was this inversion of honor so that the, the hedonism or nihilism, as we might almost say, um, itself became the honorable thing to do. And that's why I say that they despised what they had previously honored and honored what they had previously despised. Because, of course, the nihilistic view of honor is that the honorable man is himself foolish. You know, that honor, honor doesn't make sense, that the honorable man is a sap, you know, he's a dupe. And I think that was what people began to feel under the duress of the plague, right? That uh, under, under, with, with the threat of the plague, honor no longer made sense, and therefore the man who practiced it, rather than being admirable, um, you know, was in fact, as I say, foolish and therefore contemptible, and that, that the, the smart thing to do, even the sensible thing to do, right, was to, was to grab some pleasure while still one still could, and so that therefore became also the honorable thing. I think the treatment that the city gives honor wouldn't be nearly as interesting, right, if it weren't for that, for that inversion. Great. Um, I'm, I now want to uh, combine a couple of questions we have. Uh, Sharon Dunn and then also Josh uh, Ferrara asked this. I'll, I'll try and uh, paraphrase them. See, per Pericles, in the speech, the great funeral oration before this plague episode, and then sort of after the narrative of the plague by Thucydides, gives this extraordinary speech that you refer to as his finest hour. In each speech, he gives a sense that there is an Athenian common political culture. And, and as you said, he, he knows it and he figures out how to rally them to unity. What, what, what is your perception of any of the liberal democracies or particularly the American liberal democracy? Is there a common political culture that could be rallied? We, we, we did see obviously rallying in World War II in, in America and other liberal democracies. Uh, after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, we saw certain rallying in unity. Are we now, the question I think is, are we now so fractured or polarized that, there, that we couldn't find a leader who could rally, rally us in a moment of civic crisis and, and bring some unity? Well, um, we can't have the culture that Athens had, right? Because the culture of Athens was a culture of honor it was a culture of arete, virtue understood as superiority. And it was a very warlike culture, right? That Athenian democracy was born in war and, and thrived on war. Whereas for modern liberal democracy, as your example suggests, war is the exception, right? World War II, a war that we certainly didn't seek, rallied us. 9-11, a terrorist attack that we certainly didn't seek, rallied us to wage wars that we didn't want to fight, but found ourselves fighting anyway. So we're in a very different situation in that regard because liberal democracy was framed by its founders from the very beginning, right, as a, a, a democracy of, of, of commerce and, 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 and tolerance and you know, industry, not, 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 a, not a republic of war. That, of course, doesn't mean we don't have a common political culture behind which we could rally. I, you know, I guess that I'm not so deeply um, pessimistic about this is some people. You know, if you, if you read Tocqueville, you come away with, among other things, the conviction that a Lincoln would be absolutely impossible. <laughs> and yet Lincoln came along. <laughs> and Lincoln was an outstandingly great statesman. If you don't believe me, Michael Zucker will tell you that, I'm sure. And, and Tocqueville's not to be blamed for not, for not predicting him. So, I would say, I don't, I, I'm not sure that I see on the American horizon right now, the statesman or stateswoman who would be capable of rallying the American people. It might be more likely the latter than the former. Um, but um, 
I, 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 that's not to say that it, that it couldn't be done. I mean, I, I do think that a big part of the problem um, is our, 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 our political classes. I mean, so, I mean, to some extent, therefore, I, I accept the Morris, you know, Fiorina argument that, that, that the, these divisions are primarily divisions among the elites. And then unfortunately, you know, the elites are fomenting these divisions among, among the people as well. I don't think that there's that much difference really between the typical um, Democratic voter and the typical Republican voter. Um, I, I, I think that there are differences, obviously, but I think that statesmanship could address those differences in a helpful way. Unfortunately, you know, most of our, our, our current bunch of statesmen are not addressing them in a helpful way. Thank you. Another uh, question from Ilana Quint, who's one of our graduates now studying at law school. Uh, this is about, uh, on, on a similar theme, we've posed this kind of question several times, analogies, wisdom from Thucydides that we might apply to our current circumstances. So uh, this is about the, the modern invention of globalization or, or globalism as a, as a political economic project. So now that, now that we have built this from our great scientific and economic and technological confidence, um, what, what lessons about responsibility, political judgment and political responsibility for a strategy or project that you've built, what lessons might arise from the, these episodes in book two or from the larger narrative that Thucydides gives us? There is globalism already in Thucydides, because in fact, Pericles presents Athens as the first global city. The problem is that globalism goes together with imperialism in Thucydides. And that city, which is the opposite of a global city, namely Sparta, right, is also the city that, 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 that eschews imperialism, right, as, as Athens does not. So for, for Thucydides, a certain parochialism it goes together with the issue of, of, of globalism and um, imperialism, you might say, already implies a certain globalism. And one of the interesting things about the early, the Athenians in the early books of the work, especially the Athenian spokesman in Sparta in book one, they accept responsibility for their empire and they accept responsibility for being a better empire than any empire has ever been. And by a better empire, they mean a fairer empire an empire that takes the, the, the good of the subjects and, and the sensibilities of the subjects more into account. The problem, I think, is that that view of empire turns out to be utopian. Because ultimately, as the Athenians themselves recognize, even empire exercised in a gentle or lenient way will provoke the resistance and opposition of the subjects um, and <clears throat> therefore will require more harshness in order to maintain than the Athenians wish to exercise. And also, as the whole Thucydides narrative shows, imperialism has implications for domestic politics, um, which, which, are, which are extremely grave and serious. And the Athenians in their domestic politics end up paying a high price for their imperialism. Um, globalism, as we understand it, is curious, right? Because in a, it's, it's it's sub-political and it's trans-political. It's not political, right? Um, no, no one country rules the world. No one wants one country to rule the world. And no one really believes that there could be an effective world government. But we have globalization, right, proceeding apace in, in, these, in, in the sub-political and trans-political way. Um, that, I think, is, 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 is uniquely modern. And, and it seems that it's this, you know, it's this, this problem you know, sort of peculiar to um, modernity, that it's very hard in modernity to strike the right balance between, um, between particularism and, and, and globalism. No one wants the extreme of either, but it is actually very difficult to find the right balance between them. And the, re related to that, if, if a, a different kind of globalism the, the, the technological economic globalization, right, of modern transportation, modern communications, if that's somehow involved in a global pandemic, right, that, that this spreads from its apparent origin in a province of China now to be on every continent, um, 
what political responsibility do the the architects and certainly America's political culture is one of the architects of this kind of globalization. What what responsibility do we have to think about pandemics, global pandemics, in the wake of this particularly severe COVID nineteen one? Well, I think we have a responsibility first of all from the point of view of our own national interest and national welfare, because obviously a global you know pandemic is a is 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 a threat to every people. I also am inclined to the view, which is not much in fashion, um, that um, just as Athens, as the world's leading democracy, actually assumed a certain responsibility in its time, um, which, its, which its leaders and even some of its ordinary citizens recognized, so I, I take the view that America, as the leading democracy of our time, has a certain global responsibility. And I am struck by the fact that in the past, um, um, not, very, not very distant past, I think America would have accepted much more responsibility for battling the pandemic on the global level than it does today, right? Where basically America um, has become the, <laughs> um, the shutdown nation of shutdowns, right? I mean, that, that America is, is cowering within its house um, as it's encouraging its citizens, right? This, this very strange phenomenon that we do our duty, we do our, our civic duty by cowering in our houses. So we can take pride in having you know, fulfilled our civic responsibility. It's, 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 it, and we leave treating the disease to the professionals. So it's a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's a very bizarre situation. It's still the case in the world today, and this shows you the limits of political globalism, that if you want something done, there's gotta be a powerful nation that takes the lead and gathers less powerful nations in support of it, right? That's, that's the only way things ever get accomplished in the world. And it's quite striking to me that in the case of this pandemic, that just hasn't happened. I think we have time for um, one more question. And this uh, might be unfair in one sense, but uh, Thucydides writes this extraordinary work. I mentioned in the introduction, for 2,500 years, there's an almost uninterrupted chain of people who have studied this work. And, and this is one of the episodes where he shows extraordinary insight. As far as I know, in, certainly in Western civilization, there's nothing like this analytical care uh, about the, the epidemiology, so to speak, of this plague and then the social consequences and larger consequences of it. Uh, but it is interesting that he, so the, the question coming from Brian Evan, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, no, Daniel poses this question. Why, why does he not, being so analytical, why does he not speculate about what the cause is? He just says, I'm not going to speculate on the cause. I'm just going to give an account of, of what its effects were in these various dimensions, where he's, so much of the work from the very beginning is focused on causes and trying to find, you know, don't be distracted by the proximate cause, get to the deeper cause of something. So is it, do you find that interesting or is that just an unfair question to pose about Thucydides? No, I don't think it's an unfair question. I think the, the plague takes its place in his overall presentation of nature as dominated by a certain dialectic of motion and rest. Um, and the plague um, would be an example of motion or disturbance, kinesis, which is also a word that he applies to the war, right? In the very first paragraph of the work, he says that the war was the greatest kinesis, the greatest motion or the greatest disturbance or perturbation. And so I think he thinks of nature as subject to eruptions. And there, there, there are lesser cases of natural eruptions throughout the work. I think that there's something Socratic about that. I mean that Thucydides knows what he doesn't know, and he knows that this aspect of nature um, is a closed book to him. I don't think he. I don't think he precludes the fact that someday there will be a better understanding. I think that he records the symptoms with such care, um, in the hopes again that, that that people who recognize the plague in the future may be able to do more about it right, than than the Athenians were able to do. But I think that you know he. He, he believes, his, he's, he's very empirical, and he believes very much in a certain principle of autopsis, of seeing things for oneself. 
And so I think he reported as much of the plague as he could see for himself and as he could, could gather from reliable reports. The reliable reports being primarily reports as to where the plague had struck previously, because that's the one aspect of his account which he could not have known firsthand. But I think that he felt that he, he observed what he could observe, um, but, he, but the causes were simply hidden from observation. I don't deny that he, like other ancients, would be astonished right, at what we've been able to, <laughs> you know, to disclose about the world. But I think that from his point of view, it would have been presumptuous um, for him to um, claim to know more than that the evidence didn't support the notion that it was sent by Apollo, which is something that he <laughs> never, says, never says explicitly, but I think suggests by pointing out that the plague had struck so many other cities against which Apollo had no known beef. So that it was a little too Athensocentric of the Athenians to think that Apollo had sent the plague just for them. Interesting. Well, regrettably, we will have to leave it at that. We've come up uh, against uh, one hour of time. I have a, a, some brief closing remarks, uh, including a thanks. Uh, we thank everyone who joined us. We had uh, 120 people at one point joining us for this first of the pandemic dialogues, this first webinar. Uh, again, we hope you will check our website, which is scetl.asu.edu to learn more about this virtual seminar uh, series and podcast, The Pandemic Dialogues. Upcoming in the webinar sessions, we have a discussion of Boccaccio and the Decameron, another on Edgar Allan Poe, a short story he wrote about a plague. And uh, so far, our last scheduled one is a, on the recent pop culture fascination with zombies and the zombie apocalypse. Uh, so if you enjoyed this discussion, we hope you will learn more about the podcast um, uh, as well in the Pandemic Dialogues uh, discussion of Camus' The Plague. You can find that on iTunes or on other podcast platforms. For that, it's not a live session, but you can connect by Twitter with the faculty, our two faculty colleagues conducting that discussion. You can also find a recording of this webinar and the subsequent episodes in the webinar uh, on our website. So with that, I want to thank our colleagues in the school who made this webinar possible, Dr. Carol McNamara, Dr. Luke Perez, Joe Martin, and Morgan Raddick. And thanks again to our guests, Clifford Orwin of the University of Toronto, and to our visiting scholar, Dr. Catherine Zuckert. Thank you, be well, and good night.